Amen. Thank you, Father God. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that you are beautiful, Lord God, that we get to see your beauty in this place that we live in, that we get to see your beauty when we wake up and when we're going to sleep. Even on an overcast day like this, it's so 
beautiful, Lord God, this place that you have given us to live in. And we just give you all the praise and honor and glory. And we lift our voices with creation. Mm, thank you, Father God. Who and from the darkness I called your name into darkness your mercy came you called me out lifted me up how great is your love you bore my weakness you took my shame buried my burdens in fields of grace you called me Perfection gave your life for us, and we are amazed. We stand in awe, for we have been changed by the power of the cross. How great, how great, how great is your love! How great, how great, how great. so true there has never 
never been, there will never be a God like you, a love so true, there has never been. Father God, thank you for your faithfulness. I just ask, mm, in this place right now, Father God, your presence, I give space for your presence. Mm. As we say, how great is your love for us that it would be a reality, Father God. It wouldn't just be words that we sing, words sitting on a page, Lord God but that that reality, that truth of your love would sink in deep, would sink in so deep this morning, Jesus. Hmm. There's a name that levels mountains Carves out highways through the seas And I've seen his power unravel battles Right in front of me There's a faith that stands defiant Sins Goliath to his knees And I've seen his praise unravel shackles Right off my
God, we thank you for your presence here. We thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you, Father God, for the victories that you have called out before us as we step out in faith this week, as we go from this place today, Father God, the victories that you have called out into this coming week by the power of your name, King Jesus. We give you all honor, all glory, all power, all praise in your name. We say together, amen. amen. Stay tuned for this video.
Rolling Stones Church, next Sunday after the 10.30 service, we're having a volunteer luncheon here at Ali'i Drive. Anyone is welcome who serves with the church or is interested in serving. This is our chance to thank you and invite you to join a summer team. Also, we're hiring for the setup and breakdown. You can email Jay to apply or head to the connect table outside to get more information. Have a great Sunday. All right, good morning. Welcome to Living Sounds Church. And kids, you can head out for children's ministry. Uh, if you haven't already gone, that's for kids up through the fifth grade under the big tent outside. Uh, kids two and under inside the building to the north here, which is the nursery. And as they're leaving, two other announcements I want to throw out for you. Number one, we're having water baptisms after the third service today. We're going to be doing them about 200 yards to the north of us here in the ocean. If you've never been baptized, today's the day to do it. We'll gather outside this door um, right after the third service. That means about 11.45 and walk down there. Uh, if you want to come down and watch the folks getting baptized, you're welcome to join us with that. Second announcement is once a month we have a prayer and worship time out at Pine Tree Center for men. Six o'clock, the only requirement is that you're male. Other than that, anybody can come. Um, six o'clock this Friday, Pine Tree Center. Okay. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for your love. Lord Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence. We just ask today that you bless us, Holy Spirit, with the insight that we need, the revelation that we need that, that surpasses the speculation that we so often live by. I ask you to move today as you show us what needs to be emptied out to make room for what you want to fill up. I just pray your blessing on us today for the equipping to become all you want us to be. We ask all of this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're starting a new series today. It's going to last about five weeks, less if I talk too much today, more if I don't hit everything that I'm supposed to, but about four or five weeks, it's going to be looking at the Holy Spirit, who He is, what He does, how He comes, why the Holy Spirit is somebody that we need to be focused in on. We're going to be looking at some particulars with it. Now, this isn't just a message to fill our minds with information about the Holy Spirit. The idea is this is to establish culture. We want to be a culture of faith. We want to be a culture that, that is everything we are supposed to be. The, the church in, in America today, and you've heard this before probably, the church in America today is kind of like a family divided by divorce. You've got churches that are intent on the Word, on the, the, the Scriptures, which is good, and you've got churches that are intent on the Holy Spirit, the gifts and the power, which is also good. But the idea is so often it's been like a divorce in a family where half the kids have gone with the Word, half the kids have gone with the Spirit, and it's like you don't have visitation rights with each other. The idea for the church is we are supposed to be together as one united family. We as Living Sons Church want to be together with Word and Spirit coming together as one. You can't really have the Word without the Spirit. The Holy Spirit wrote the Word for goodness sakes. I mean, you can't really have the Spirit without the Word because the Word reveals to us who the Holy Spirit is in the first instance. They have to come together for us to get it right, otherwise we're going to be a really screwed up family. The idea for us is both need to be in place. I've told you this story so many times before, but it's foundational for me. 1996, I'm trying to understand what a church is supposed to look like as I feel called by God to be involved in his work of building a church in Kona. I'm at the old airport beach park, and I say, what's it supposed to look like, God? And a biplane flies by. And I feel like, I don't hear the audible voice, but I have a sense God saying, that's what it looks like. And explain further, please. And the thoughts that came to mind, and I'm not very aeronautically oriented, so these are thoughts that I, I really do believe came from God, are the church is to look like this, a dual wingspan. You've got to have one wing for stability, that's sound doctrine, scripture. You've got to have another wing for lift and power, that's the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit. Both have to be in play. You've got to have both sound doctrine, and the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit to be who we are supposed to be. So we want to go and look at it today in the next few weeks. There are people here that are going, uh-oh, I didn't mean to step into this kind of mess. I was here Easter, and you said last week, come on, if you don't believe this stuff, come back. Doubters are welcome. Well, here's the deal. Doubters are still welcome. And we've got some people who trust Jesus who are doubters in this area of the Holy Spirit. It's the idea that we've got a, a variety of people here today online. One group of you, one group of people here um, are very similar to a group that 
uh, the Apostle Paul encountered in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. He encountered this group of people, and, and uh, he said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they go, who? We've never even heard of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is kind of an amazing story because Acts chapter 19 is actually about 20 years after the church has been established. 20 years after the Holy Spirit's come on the day of Pentecost, and you've got people 20 years later who've received Jesus Christ by people who supposedly know Jesus Christ who had never heard of the Holy Spirit. And again, that's the situation with us many times today. People come to Jesus. People come to hear about Jesus, the gospel of salvation, the cross, the resurrection. And then somehow the rest of the story never gets told. It's the idea that the Holy Spirit is a part of the story, part and parcel of the story. You can't really have the first part of the story without the second and have the whole story. Another segment of the population that we have here, dem demographic we have here, are people, and I, I fall into this, who know something about the Holy Spirit, but we need to unlearn some things that we've learned before. We need to relearn some things. We need to have a uh, reinvigorating of what we know about the Holy Spirit so that it becomes something more than just knowing about the Holy Spirit. So we want to dive in and, and look at all this. I mean, it's kind of a, a weird thing to me. I was thinking about it today. Uh, Pentecost Sunday. Um, Pentecost Sunday is the Sunday where we celebrate the Holy Spirit coming on the day of Pentecost over 2,000 years ago. Pentecost Sunday this year falls on June 5th, about 42 days from now, I think it is. Now, everybody celebrates Christmas. Christian, non-Christian, we're all, all in for Christmas. We want to celebrate, as a believer, the birth of Jesus Christ. Easter, the resurrection, and Good Friday, the cross, we celebrate those. I mean, really big deals in history, and we go in for it. But, but does anybody really have Pentecost that rises to the level of Easter and Christmas in terms of of what comes into your mind with important celebrations in the faith? Not for me, but it needs to be. It really does. I mean, that's why we're doing this, because I, I want us to have four or five weeks in advance of Pentecost coming so that we can actually have the kind of focus on Pentecost that we do for Good Friday, for Easter, for Christmas, where we, we actually are celebrating the Holy Spirit and again, like I said, we're going to be looking at the who, the what, the why, the how of the Holy Spirit. Today is supposed to be about the who, but I'll tell you right up front, we're going to lapse into the what, the why, and the how, and I don't know how to avoid it, because otherwise it's just blank information stuff that, that we need to have some of the other mixed in with in order to, to actually handle it. When we look at the Holy Spirit, we see it, number one, as a promise. It, not it, him. He, as a promise. John chapter 14, verses 16, 17 is one place where this promise was laid out by Jesus before he went to the cross. In John 14, Jesus told his disciples, he's telling us, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him and know him or know him. But you know him because... He abides with you and will be in you. The wording of that is important, and other translations actually say it more clearly than, than this, New American Standard Version, and it's this. The Holy Spirit was there. The Holy Spirit was with Jesus, in Jesus, on Jesus, and the Holy Spirit was apparent to the, 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 the apostles as they watched Jesus and was intermittently present on them to do the work they did, but he was not yet in them. When did he get in them? He got in them at Pentecost. That's what Jesus was saying. He's going to be in you. What had to happen before he could get in them? Well, they had to be born again, and they weren't yet born again. Jesus had not yet gone to the cross, so there was no regenerating work that had happened in them yet. So he's saying, look ahead, and, and this, is, this is what's to come. So we see the Holy Spirit as a promise. We see the Holy Spirit as a gift. We see the Holy Spirit as a stewardship. And we're going to try to hit on all that today. But let's just, right now, try to get the, the, the aerial view, the big picture focus on who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is not a thing, not an it, not a force. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit, in other words, is God. 
the Holy Spirit is as much God as the Father is God, as much God as the Son is God. Now, we have this weird deal with the Holy Spirit, sometimes with Jesus too, where we set the, the Trinity up in a way where God is more than and more important than Jesus, and Jesus is more than and more important than the Holy Spirit. And some of you are going, well, well he is. Well, that's only because we don't think rightly. See, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are equally God. They operate with different levels of authority. The Father, yes, is one who gives direction to the Son. The Son submits to the Father. The Holy Spirit speaks only what the Father says. And you go, well, okay, well, that proves my point. The Father's more important. That's because we have in our, our minds the idea that authority determines preeminence. We've got in our minds that one who is in higher authority is therefore more important than one who is in lesser authority. And some of you are already squinting real hard going, well, of course. No, that's not right. <laughs> See, okay, this is going to really get some people upset. Husbands and wives are equal. Equal. But the husband has authority over the wife. Does that make the wife less important than the husband? The answer is no. But because our world can't conceive that it's otherwise, we have arguments constantly that the husband is not in authority over the wife. Jesus is in, in the position of being under authority to the Father. But Jesus is equal with the Father. Authority does not establish importance, value, or, or again, the level of being God. Now, I'm saying all of that, and all of you, I've lost some of you already with the husband and wife thing, I know. But I'm saying all of that with the idea that we, we understand that the Holy Spirit is not the, the fifth wheel. The Holy Spirit is not like Father, Son, and, well, yeah, the Holy Spirit's in there somewhere, but we don't understand why, how. He's equal. He's equal with the Father, equal with the Son. The Father loves us. Jesus saves us. The Holy Spirit is the presence with us. I mean, it's, it's something that isn't going to come in one serving for us. It's something that we've got to work through. I, I think over the lifetime. Now, back to the, the big picture. Holy Spirit's God. Holy Spirit was part of creation. Holy Spirit created the earth with the Father and with the Son. The Holy Spirit was equal with them. Holy Spirit, Old Testament, was around the whole time then. It's not like he appeared on the day of Pentecost and he was like all of a sudden into existence. He's eternal with the Father and the Son. He appeared in the Old Testament on particular people at particular times for particular purposes. You see it with Samson. You see it with Gideon. You see it with Isaiah, the prophets. Came, went, there, gone, but accomplished the purposes through people that God wanted to uh, accomplish. Then you see, as you move on through the Old Testament, in Joel chapter 2, the father prophesying through Joel that, okay, you've seen the Holy Spirit here and there making cameo appearances in history, but there's going to come a time when the Holy Spirit is going to come, and the Holy Spirit is going to be there in all of my children, all of my children. Everyone who I call a child, a son or a daughter, is going to have the Holy Spirit. Fast forward a few hundred years, and then Jesus Christ is born, God becoming man. And what happens when Jesus is born? The Holy Spirit begins to make an entry into history in ways we haven't seen before. Everybody surrounding the birth of Jesus Christ has the Holy Spirit in them, on them, about them. You've got Mary with the Holy Spirit. You've got Elizabeth with the Holy Spirit. You've got, weird deal, John the Baptist in his mother's womb is approached by Mary, who has Jesus in her womb, and what happens? The Holy Spirit comes in and apparently fills John the Baptist while he's in his mother's womb before he's born as he leaps for joy in the womb as he comes into co close proximity with Jesus. And then you get Jesus. Okay, Jesus is born. He moves into his earthly ministry. And what happens as he first steps into his earthly ministry? He's baptized by John the Baptist. He comes up out of the water and a dove lands on his shoulder. And this is symbolic, as we look through Scripture, of the Holy Spirit's presence with him, on him, in him. Now, a question comes up, will Jesus not have the Holy Spirit before his baptism? I don't know. But I do know that as of his baptism, Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit. The dove is on Jesus Christ. From then on, the dove doesn't leave him. And this is, this is some symbolism we'll play with a little bit later on today. A dove is one that stays with a non-disruptive presence. In other words, 
if Jesus were starting to jump around and, and you know, move in crazy ways, it's going to scare the dove away. And what we are going to see as we look on through this is the same thing happens in terms of how we handle the dove of the Holy Spirit in terms of his presence with us. But, but let's keep going with this. What happens is Jesus is then filled with the Holy Spirit, and he instructs his disciples on the Spirit's arrival for all of them. John chapter 14 and 16, read through those yourself. John chapter 14 and 16 are primarily about Jesus' instruction on the Holy Spirit coming, what that's going to be like. He says, wait. Wait for the Holy Spirit to come. He says, look, you can't, you can't achieve anything until you receive what I have for you. Don't go out trying to do stuff until my power is in you. Wait for the Holy Spirit. They do wait. Day of Pentecost comes. This is after Jesus' ascension into heaven. And on the day of Pentecost, we read about it in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit falls on all of the disciples. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. They speak with new tongues. They're given boldness, it says, and they're given new power. And this is identified as a promise available to every Christian. Acts chapter 2, verses 37 and 38. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, that is, people Peter was preaching to, and said to Peter and the rest of the disciples, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized. Those are things that we have the choice of doing. Those are steps that we take, repentance and choosing to be water baptized. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise of, this promise of the Spirit is for you and your children and for all who are off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. The parakletos, that is Greek for helper, the one who comes alongside, is coming. Jesus has described who this is in another way in John chapter 16, verses 7 to 11, where he says, but I tell you the truth, it's for your advantage that I go away. Again, such an amazing verse telling the disciples who love Jesus, who've seen his power, who've seen his, his wonder and miracles, and he says, look, it's better for you if I go because it's to your advantage, because if I don't go, the Holy Spirit's not going to come. Let's keep on with the verses. But I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, this is what he does, He'll convict the world concerning sin and convict the world concerning righteousness and convict the world concerning judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me and concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. When he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth for he will not speak on his own initiative but whatever he hears he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. This is so broad. This is so wonderful. This is so amazing. And it's something that we receive. The instruction of the Holy Spirit that moves us from people of speculation to people of revelation. That move us to the place where we are ready to receive the revelation that comes from God and let go of the speculation that, that the rest of the world lives by. He comes as comforter. I mean... I know he's come as comforter for me. You've experienced probably, I hope, for yourself too. I mean, you lose someone you love. You, you have disaster hit your life. And, and you have this, this peace that passes understanding that comes in. It doesn't mean you don't grieve, but it does mean that you're able to sustain through, through things that, that otherwise you couldn't sustain through. You, you have him as a convictor. I know I've had him as a convictor. He convicted me of sin. He brought me to my knees to receive Jesus, to seek forgiveness, to, to get the security of eternity in heaven and not hell. But since then, he's also been the one who's convicted me of righteousness, that my sins are gone. They are past. They are past. I still sin and I need to repent. But the conviction of righteousness is something that the Holy Spirit does, where he convicts you. He brings to heart the reminder that it's by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. You are forgiven. You are loved. You are accepted. And that never changes. And that's what you need to know. That's what you need to hear when the enemy comes in trying to bring condemnation. There is no condemnation. They're only lies. 
There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It takes the Holy Spirit to make that real for you. If it's just a theological concept, it's something that you can forget, that you can let go of, that you can not really, really believe. But when the Holy Spirit brings it in, he brings a conviction of it. He goes down deep. He roots it in your life so that you, you aren't in a place where condemnation is going to come in. He's the guide who shows you which way to go. He's the revealer of, of the truth. He brings the fruit in your life, the character issues, into increasing growth and development. I've got a long way to go with that, but it's a process we go through. And he brings the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit to, to bear on us. Now, some people look at all this and go, okay, I'm, I'm hearing what you say. It's a, it's a promise. And it's a gift, but, but I'm not seeing it. Do I not have the Holy Spirit? Well, Romans 8 says that if you follow Jesus, if you have followed Jesus, if you receive Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in you. The question is not whether you have the Holy Spirit. It's whether you have actually received the gift of the Holy Spirit and are making use of it. It's kind of like if, if um, Pauline, my wife, bought me a stationary bicycle for Christmas. And she wants me to use it so that I can get my blood pressure down, get my heart rate lower, maybe you know, lose a few pounds, I don't know. So I, I say, thank you for the stationary bicycle, and I have it right there in the middle of the living room floor. And then six months later, I return it to, to the store. And, and the guy at the counter says, anything wrong with this? And I go, no, I don't think so. He said, well, why are you returning it? I said, because it didn't do anything for my heart rate, didn't do anything to, to cause me to lose weight, didn't do anything to do anything. I said, well, how often did you use it? Never. I never used it. I mean, <laughs> stupid, ridiculous. Yeah. But this is, this is the deal with the Holy Spirit. So many people go, well, I've got the Holy Spirit in me. I mean, it says that in Romans chapter 8. If I'm a believer in Jesus, I've got the Holy Spirit in me, but I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing any change. I'm not seeing any change in terms of my security, in terms of the character issues, in terms of the power. I'm not seeing it. You hadn't gotten on the bicycle. You've got to get on the bicycle and pedal some. It's the idea that the Holy Spirit, yes, he comes to us, but we've got to go after him at the same time. It's one of those paradoxes of Scripture where there's got to be both happening. He's come, but we've got to receive him in action. Faith is action. Faith is not just saying, I believe in my head and my heart that the Holy Spirit is in me. Faith is taking the steps towards the fullness of what he came to bring for us. That's what we've got to do. That's faith. Faith takes action towards what we need to have. It means that you've, okay, one of the things we're going to talk about next week, the following, is one of the, or the gifts of the Holy Spirit. A lot of gifts, and that's where a lot of controversy comes in. There's tongues, there's prophecy, there's evangelism, there's teaching, et cetera, et cetera. Most controversial is probably tongues and then prophecy right after that. Okay, to get the gift of tongues to the gift of prophecy, what do you think happens? What do you think happens? You get prayed for, that's a good step to take. Actually, not an essential step, but a good step to take. And then what happens? Well, both tongues and prophecy are something that come out of your mouth. What if you got your lips pursed shut, and you're saying, give me the gift of tongues, give me the gift of prophecy? <laughs> Guess what? The Holy Spirit goes, you're really dumb, Bill. I mean, open your mouth. You've got to open your mouth. I mean, in, in terms of prophecy, we see in the Old Testament, it's something that people had to learn to do. In terms of teaching, to, do we think now, do we think now somebody who has the gift of teaching, that if they got saved yesterday, got filled with the Holy Spirit tomorrow, and they received the gift of teaching the next day, that we're going to put them up front and let them expound on all of the nuances of Scripture? No. They have to go through some training and get ready for it. It's the same thing with every other gift. Tongues to have the gift, you've got to open your mouth and move your tongue. You've got to open your mouth and let words come out. You've got to open your mouth and participate with the process of the Holy Spirit working through you. It's the same with, with every aspect of what the Holy Spirit is doing in us. He's a promise. He's a gift from God that we absolutely have to make use of, like the stationary bike. He is supernatural. He gives access to the supernatural without abandoning the Bible. He is, he is essential. And again, this is where we don't believe it sometimes. We say the Holy Spirit's not essential, and then we try to point out people who've done amazing things in church history who didn't have the Holy Spirit in them. Well, number one, you don't know they didn't have the Holy Spirit in them. You don't know what their situation was. But number two, 
I would go so far as to say, I don't care who you're trying to point out. If they, in fact, did not have the Holy Spirit in them, then they did not accomplish what God wanted accomplished in their lives, period. It's the idea that he is essential for us to be who God intends us to be, for God to work through us the way he wants to work through us. He is essential for us to be thermostats and not thermometers. You know the story? A thermometer measures the temperature. A thermostat sets the temperature. If you're a thermometer in this culture today, what happens? You just become part of the culture. You just reflect what the culture, what noise the culture is making, what sounds, what temperature the culture is operating at. You reflect it, and you are just like them. That's what a thermometer is. Just like the temperature in the room, that's what the thermometer measures. A thermostat does what? A thermostat sets the temperature and establishes what the climate's going to be in the room. And that's what we're called to be. But you can't do that. I can't do that. We can't do that together by our own strength, by our own intellect, by our own strategies and plans. It takes the power, the supernatural capacity and power of the Holy Spirit to enable us to be thermostats that actually set the temperature for the culture in each generation that, that, passes, that, passes, that passes through. I mean, we need to wait for this gift so that, again, we... We receive what's necessary to operate with the power that we need to operate with. We receive before we can achieve. We're in a world where achieving is often necessary before receiving comes about. You have to achieve a certain level or standard of work. You have to achieve a certain degree um, or, or, or standard in education before you can receive the diploma, before you can receive the raise, before you can receive the, the advancement. Not that way in the kingdom. We first receive a free gift, a promise that comes to us. And then when we receive the free gift, the grace of God, then achievement follows. Um, I've told you this before, but years ago, years ago, that parking lot we used across the street was covered with woods. It was covered with, with all sorts of underbrush and trees, everything else. And um, Bishop of State rented it to us. They said, if you can clear it, then you can you know, get it tax-free. So... We hired some people, we had volunteers coming in, and we were out there with chainsaws and, and all sorts of stuff, clearing it by hand. After about three weeks, we had cleared about a 10 by 20 foot section of the place. And then somebody had the brilliant idea, why don't we pay and bring some heavy equipment in here? And we paid and brought some heavy equipment in here. And then when we did, the place was completely cleared out in about four or five days. I mean. This is kind of how it is with the Holy Spirit in our own efforts. I mean, we can work forever in our own efforts. We can get all sweaty and dirty, and, and we can actually feel like we're making some headway, you know, the 10 by 20 foot square. But we're not coming anywhere close to clearing what needs to be cleared and advancing the kingdom. The heavy equipment has to come in. We've got to be ready to receive the, the suggestion, the gift of the heavy, uh, heavy equipment, before we can really start achieving the things that God actually has in place for, for us to achieve in, in this, this, this generation. Now, in addition to being a gift and a promise, the Holy Spirit is a stewardship. And I want to spend just a few minutes looking at this before we go today. The Holy Spirit's presence in us is actually a stewardship that we've been given. And it's probably not going too far to say that the primary role of a believer is to steward the presence of the Holy Spirit. I mean, we'd like to be able to reduce it to formulas and principles, but if formulas and principles take precedence over the presence, then something's matter. It, it, it's kind of like, okay, I know how I approach the Holy Spirit, and I assume most of you do too. I want the Holy Spirit to fill me, help me with my ministry, help me fulfill my potential, help me move forward with everything I can possibly do. Help me, help me, help me, for me, for me, for me. Now, that's not completely bad, but it's definitely not completely good. The Holy Spirit is God in us. God in us. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God in us. The presence of God in us. That's how Scripture describes the Holy Spirit. And if that is, if he is the presence of God in us, then what do you think we need to be doing? Stewarding the presence of God in us. We've been given the gift of his presence. 
and our focus needs to be on what it looks like to steward that. Jesus had the Holy Spirit given to him again at his baptism. Again, I'm not going to get into arguments and discussions right now on what this looks like for him or what it did look like for him before he was baptized, but let's just acknowledge that something special happened with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, on the day of Pentecost, the dove landing on his shoulder. Now, what happened from there on? From there on, Jesus lived a life that was fully dependent on the Holy Spirit and fully pleasing to the Holy Spirit. He had the fruit of the Holy Spirit in him in perfect form. He had the gifts of the Holy Spirit operating through him in a way that's never been seen before, nor will it ever be seen again. But what's that mean for us? Well, it means that we need to, I think one of the things we can do, we should do, is understand how to steward that presence of the dove on us. What's going to make the dove fly away? What's going to disrupt the presence of the Holy Spirit, the peaceful presence of the Holy Spirit? And Scripture tells us two things, two things that we need to be focused in on as we are intent on stewarding the presence of the Holy Spirit. And the two things are, number one, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit, and that is involving issues of sin. That means that we, we don't grieve the Holy Spirit by anger, by bitterness. I mean, the list goes on and on. It's about character. We, we don't grieve the Holy Spirit and disrupt his abiding presence in us. And number two, second thing, is we don't quench the Holy Spirit. We don't quench the Holy Spirit. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse, verse 19. Long verse, do not quench the Spirit. It's, it's the idea that, that it's kind of like quenching the Spirit. It's kind of like a, a water hose that's got a kink in it, you know. The flow stops. How do we quench the Holy Spirit? Well, continue reading there. You can find out some of what is involved. But, but basically, quenching the Holy Spirit is when we... We have this, this doubting of his power, this questioning of his ability, this, this standing with cynicism in terms of, of what he intends to accomplish in us, through us, or through other people. It's, it's actually a dangerous area to, to be occupying. Stewardship means we don't quench, we, 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 don't, we don't grieve the Holy Spirit, we do everything we can to be focusing on this, this stewardship aspect of what he wants done in our lives and with us. I mean, think about it. What does it mean? What does it mean to steward the presence of God? It, it means that we want to be people that are, are moving into greater intimacy with God and, and doing it for no other reason than the end result of increased intimacy with God. It's hard for some of us who are goal-oriented to really slow down and do that, to back up a couple of steps and say, look, this is not primarily about seeing you fulfill your purpose. This is not primarily about seeing you fulfill your ministry, unless we understand that our primary role, our primary purpose, our primary ministry is a stewardship of, of the person of the Holy Spirit of the presence of the, the Holy Spirit in our lives. If we are really intent, and I'm, I'm, I tell you, I'm, I'm speaking in large part theoretically here, because I haven't done this to the extent I need to do this, but I have believed the concept that if we can be increasingly intent on the role we have in stewarding the presence of the Holy Spirit, all of the other stuff that we want so badly is just going to come naturally. All of the other stuff that we want to happen is going to flow in without always having to even ask for it. That presence that's stewarded accurately and, and adequately it is going to move us into the ability to do what? To, without even meaning to, speak the words of God. To, without even meaning to, bless people with encouragement. Without even trying, having, having prophecy ooze out of us having healing flow, having, having the reality of, of being one who looks like they've been in the presence of Jesus, being, being in the room with you. I mean, 
this is, this is what the stewardship is, is actually supposed to, is supposed to look like for, for us. It, it's the idea that we, we need to, to work at it, but not work at it in the way we've often worked at it. It's understanding that our private time with the Holy Spirit is going to affect everything else in terms of the public times that we have anywhere else. Assignments. Let's wind it up real quickly here. Assignments this week. Number one, consider making it a rule that you are not going to have a quiet time, a prayer time, unless you have a pen or a journal with you when you have your quiet time or prayer time. I mean, I'm still amazed. I, it, just me, maybe, I don't know. I'm still amazed that anybody can sit down with their Bible and have a quiet time in the morning for longer than five minutes without having a pen and a notebook with them. It's so that you can steward the presence of God. It's so that you can write down the impressions, the thoughts, the ideas that flow. It, it's like, I mean, I, I used to think, I used to think that when I had a quiet time and my mind started wondering, I would suspect, and I started thinking about, oh, I forgot to call that person. Oh, I, I've got that appointment tomorrow. I didn't even think about that. Oh, I, oh, I, oh, I. And these things would come to mind. I think, that's the devil. That's the enemy coming in trying to get me off focus in what God wants. I don't think it is anymore. I mean, it's part of the process of, of the, the, the intimacy and the stewardship of the presence where the Holy Spirit brings to mind the things that we're th supposed to think about. He reminds us of those things that we need to write down. I know we can get distracted and get off on tangents. We don't need to. But, but it's the idea of coming in with this, this mindset that that the presence of the Holy Spirit is more powerful than the presence of the enemy. And we give way too much credit to Satan speaking in than we do the Holy Spirit speaking in. And as we put ourselves in that position, I think there's a gro I know there's a growing that happens as we, as we hear and listen. And if we write these things down, yeah, it's a little more work. Yes, you've got to be intentional about it. Yes, you've got to pay attention. It's easy to sit there with your Bible and just shoot the prayers up to God and read the scriptures and then say, okay, I put in my 15 minutes and I'm done for the day. You can put my gold star beside my name up there in heaven today, God. And it's not about that. It's about stewarding his presence in our lives in a very real way. So write it down. So assignment this week, number one, try this. Read Psalm 37. Psalm 37, most of you are probably familiar with. Psalm 37 is that psalm that begins, don't fret about evildoers, don't be envious towards wrongdoers, they'll wither quickly and fade like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. He will give you the desires of your heart. Doesn't mean he's going to give you everything you want. It means he's going to put desires in your heart. He's going to give you the desires of your heart. He's going to change the desires of our hearts. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. And it goes on. It's a medium-sized psalm, long enough so that you can read it every day and find something new every day in it and ask the Lord to speak. Ask the Holy Spirit to direct. A lot of what it says in Psalm 37 is wait, 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 and wait. It's, it's, I think, what we, what we need to do to actually get a hold of what, what God wants us, us doing as we, as we move forward with all that he has for us. That's, that's a starting point, again, of stewarding the presence. Another suggestion, just to throw out for you, go to www.biblegateway.com, biblegateway.com, and search spirit, spirit. And you're going to come up with, I think, 563 references in Old and New Testament, Genesis to Revelation of Holy Spirit. Why do that? Again, just to give you the context, I'm not saying sit down and do it all in one day, but look through it. Look at what Scripture says about this, this third person of the Trinity, God, and have the foundation there with the information about who he is so that, again, the stewardship of his presence becomes something that's, that's a little bit more than, than just an abstract exercise. It, it's something, again, that, that's going to make all the difference in the world as we, as we move forward as, as people that have been given an assignment by God, but an assignment, again, that has to start with this, this stewardship of the presence that then enables us to make use of the gifts, to appreciate the fruits, and to understand, again, how, how it is that we're going to be the people through whom God extends his kingdom in Hawaii and, and through this world.
Um, tonight, Pine and I will be uh, here. We'll be going over the same material, but we'll do it with a little bit of discussion. You also have the opportunity, if you want to, uh, over the next four weeks while we go through the series, if you've got a question, send it in to info at livingstoneschurch.com, info at livingstoneschurch.com, and we may be able to answer those questions. We'll be doing a little podcast discussion uh, each week about this because, again, we need to get the culture deeply rooted in this, the culture established properly, properly in this to be the, the people of faith, the people of power, the people that, that glorify God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the way that we're supposed to. I hope after four or five weeks, we're comfortable saying, I love you, Holy Spirit. Simple as that. Thank you, Father, for your amazing love for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for your sacrifice. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence. Uh, we just ask you, Holy Spirit, teach us more on who you are, on how we individually can steward your presence in the way that, that glorifies you. All of it, we ask in the power of Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Uh, okay, uh, if you're on the prayer ministry team, if you would, please come up here to the front. We have some folks up here that will be praying for you, or available to pray for you, that is, um, anything you need. If you want to talk about what it means to follow Jesus, to be filled with the Spirit, to have any need you have prayed for, whether it's healing, relationships, or money, we'd be happy to pray with you for that. If you're online, we've got some folks who can pray with you. For everybody else, God bless you. Have a good rest of the week.